Yeah, put on my sweatpants and tell me it's Monday. I think that works. What's up, Stokers of Stoke Nation? This is Chad Kroger coming in with the Going Deep with Chad and JT podcast. Guys, before we begin, I'll remind you once again that we are brought to you by Manscaped. Manscaped, thank you so much for keeping our trims pubed, for looking after our hogs, for making sure that our dongs are looking fresh and clean because we may be in the Q team still, but you know what? I think even on Zoom, people can tell when you're doing full body grooming, and that's an energy that just can't be matched. So use code GODEEP20 at manscaped.com. And I'm here with my compadre, Jean Thomas. What up? Boom, clap, stokers. And we are here with a writer, director, uh, creator of Love Life on HBO Max, Sam Boyd. What up? Thank you for coming on. How's it going, guys? Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good, dude. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Can't complain. Yeah, feel good. How, how you living? Where you? Where do you live at? What, are you in um, Los Angeles? Yeah, I'm in LA. Yeah, yeah. We. Um, oh. I was in New York for a little bit making making season one of the show, and I'll be back there to do season two. But I'm. Uh, I, I do live in LA. Did your own life parallel the protagonist Anna Kendrick's uh, life? Did you? Were you single in New York? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I went to. Yeah, I went to NYU, um, and so season one definitely was me kind of plugging back into like that time in my life and a lot of those feelings and even just the places we shot and stuff like that. I tried to kind of mm. have, you know, like just go back into kind of my own memories and, and, and try to, you know, replicate certain feelings and, and, and certain moments. And, um, you know, obviously the character, you know, the main character of season one was a woman and there was, you know, there was a lot that was different about, about, you know, the character and, and myself, but there's a bunch that's, you know, that's me too. And, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, was that, it was fun to kind of work that stuff in. Was it painful at all? I know for me, I really, I love the show. I, I plowed through it a second time today and, uh, oh, thanks, man. It, it resonated so much with me and I could see myself. I told my brother when we were watching, I was like, dude, I relate to each one of these dudes. Cause she kind of, <laughs> you break the episodes up into kind of suitors or, or her main relationships. And right every dude was flawed in a really relatable way where I was like, I'd watch them talking. I'd be like, Oh fuck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, like, I felt that yeah. too. Yeah. Thanks guys. Yeah. I mean, you know, that was a lot of what was fun about it was obviously we're kind of building this main character, but you're also building these love interests and kind of walking this tightrope of like wanting them to be fun and engaging and people that you want to watch in, you know, an episode with her, but you also kind of got to keep the story on the rails and not, you know, you got to have it make sense that they don't end up together. That that's not just annoying every time. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, it was, it was fun to tr- to try to figure, figure out how to do that and, and keep it entertaining and just have, you know, have each of those guys feel like flawed in a, in a, in a kind of real feeling and explainable way. Um, and you know we had we had one guy that was a little bit more of a, a crazy a crazy dude, but you know, other than that, yeah, Max, yeah, dude, Nick Thune. I mean, I've been I've been in LA for a while doing comedy, so Nick Thune was always yeah. someone I really looked up to. He's he's a great stand up, mm-hmm. and he's tremendous. Yeah. The show. yeah, he's awesome, and and yeah, he was so good in the show, and and uh, and yeah, you know, it was it was it was kind of as much fun figuring out who those guys were going to be and, and what they were going to be like um, as it was to, to build Anna's character and, and see that through. Yeah. I, uh, I really relate to Anna's character too. Cause when I, uh, in, in the first, when they're describing her in the first, you know, uh, few minutes of the show, her background, her childhood, I was like, Oh, that's my mm-hmm. childhood. <laughs> like, I don't know if you want me to say that, but like, they, you know, divorced yeah. parents yeah. divorced at four exact same time as me and then like a wow you know uh, uh, a series of almost relationships up until my 20s right where i'm just like what's what's going on here yeah yeah <laughs> and then realizing later you know i'm like i'm like oh i had some uh, some scarring from that uh, that i wasn't even aware of but uh, totally. which was like so you know even though it was a female protagonist I, I related so deeply just right off the bat which was so interesting and um, boarding awesome. school you both yeah. went to boarding school too. Oh, I'm boarding school. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You you are Darby, dude. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm the I'm a Dar Darby. <laughs> What's Dar- the male Darby, version? Darby, yeah, 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 exactly. No, oh, yeah, I was the, the male. Oh, yeah, the, the male version. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, that's fine. Yeah. Darby yeah, yeah. two phones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dude, I read two phones. Um, Danny two phones killed me because like he was such a great guy, and I, I was know. This is and sad, sad the way point. he says. 
this is guys a lot of spoilers but like when he <laughs> says goodbye to her at the museum and he hits yeah. her with this i i would yeah. do that for he hits her with like a double chest pound peace sign and yeah. it's maybe maybe i'd be a little more self-aware and be like sorry i know that was really cheesy but like i had to do it but but the character's <laughs> like his i don't know he's just such a sincere dude it was uh it, and he doesn't yeah. look like he's going to be that guy. He looks like he's going to be a fuck boy because he's kind of right. like a good looking dude with like a wild haircut, but he ends right. up being like right. the most sincere of everybody. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you dug that. I mean, that, that was a fun one. Cause I think that one in particular was one where we kind of wanted to flip it. And, you know, Anna's character in most of the episodes is kind of the person who's trying too hard to make something happen. And, and we thought it'd be fun to kind of show her, in a situation where the tables turn and, and there's kind of a guy that's too into her and, you know, and, and kind of having women in the writer's room who were authentically writing, you know, her side of the experience and then also being able to, you know, sp speak to just being a, being a guy and, a, you know, occasionally a dopey guy who, you know, you end up in situations like that and you, you know, as you said, he has maybe a little less self-awareness. So it's not, it's not autobiography, but, but it was definitely fun to like, try to make that guy feel real and, and try to make him, you know, a, a bonehead, but also sympathetic. And, and I think with everyone, we, we just wanted to kind of make it so you could feel both sides of it. And is that, is, is your first film was in a relationship? Is, is, is that the title? Yeah. And then, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then, so this is a pretty on the nose question, but like, um, <laughs> why, why do you like to write about relationships so much? Why do you feel so compelled to kind of, yeah, uh, no, it's a part it's a, of the human experience. It's a good question. I mean, you know, yeah, the, the first movie that I made was called In a Relationship. And even before that was like a short version of that that was called In a Relationship. So it's basically the only thing I know how to write about. And I honestly think it's, you know, part of it is, is um, I love, you know, I love just like trying to, you know, trying to like depict normal people with as much kind of specificity and like, entertainment value as possible and 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 i i have found that like kind of couching that in romantic comedy or in you know love stories is is a way to kind of make them feel bigger and make them feel like things that you know that, that people will make or people will want to see um you know but you're but you're still kind of able to examine i mean it's a it's, it's why it's a funny thing that like the stuff is all kind of superficially romantic comedy, but the romantic comedy aspect of it honestly ends up being kind of the least important part to me. Or, yeah. Or the, like least the, the relationship yeah. dynamics is what you're more. Yeah. About. Yeah. It's kind of this, like um, it's kind of like a Trojan horse or something where it's like, it's like the ability, you know, really what was fun. You know, what, what I love about love life, especially is that you're, it's really just like a character study. You're just kind of going like super, you know, as you guys, Chad, Chad goes deep you know, we wanted to go as deep as possible with like, you know, our main character and, mm -hmm. you know, and you're kind of able to like, look at it through the lens of each of these relationships, but ultimately it's like, it's just like a person and, and trying to kind of look at it on less of like the cliched kind of like knight in shining armor level, but more on this kind of primal level of just like everybody wanting love. And I think especially just as like a way to kind of value your own worth or just how, you know, how love is this kind of, you know, it's this thing we consume ourselves with in life. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the biggest, the biggest thing that happens in most people's, you know, in, in a lot of people's lives, um, you know, but, 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 you know, I think, I think, or even the way you were talking about like your, your parents divorce and certain things you didn't realize, you know, were kind of scarring or connected or whatever, like just the ways that are, lives and our relationships shape us and that ultimately like the more interesting part of it to me is is you know is the is the is the shaping of the life and the kind of like coming of age of a person and and just going all the way kind of through that with a character um mm -hmm. but i don't know i you know i just it, it's it's um it's it's also like a, a tone that i like that's kind of you know funny and sweet but like a little more real hopefully and uh and yeah yeah, it's, that, that's balanced really nicely in the show. Yeah, and I, there's this Thank novelist you. I like, Richard Price, and all of his stories are like yeah. cop stories. But right. like, Charlie Rose asked him, I was like, why do you always do cop stories? He's like, it's just an easy way for a plot. He's like, right. I really, I'm just about the characters and stuff, but right. if you throw right. a murder in there up top, it, it flows nicely. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's it, that's, you know, 
it's obviously, um, you know, there's, there's even, there's even more to work with when you're, when you're working in a genre like that. So like romantic comedy still is pretty soft, but, but it is a nice yeah. way to kind of, sh to kind of shape these, these kinds of stories. And I think especially just story, you know, a lot of it too, is just like drawn from my own life or from my friends' lives. And so, you know, you can kind of write like, you know, family dramas or something like that. But I think in wanting to kind of write about, you know, m me and my peers and, and my world and just kind of, you know, the, the, the stuff that I've noticed, you know, that's kind of the best way to, to, to shape it and, and to like be able to look at young people in a, in a way that feels like a, you know, feels like a real movie or feels like a real show. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what rom-coms do you, uh, were you influenced by? Um, it's funny. I've kind of gone like all the way through it where like in, even like in college, I, I kind of like, I was super into them and even shitty ones. And I kind of made it like my thing. And then, and then honest, to be honest, the more that I make them, like the less that I care about watching them. And, um, that makes sense. and, and especially the shitty ones, but you know, I think the ones that like mean the most to me, you know, are, are the same. And that's, kind of, you know, like Annie Hall or when Harry met Sally or, um, you know, like a movie, like an old movie, the apartment. Um, and, you know, and again, it's just those ones where it's hitting all these feelings, but it's still, you know, it's still kind of, I'm always kind of trying to find the midpoint where it's like, how can we, what's like, what's like the realist feeling thing that still is commercial and fun to watch, you know? Those shitty and, ones, those shitty ones can be really valuable. Like Ghost of Girlfriend yeah, in the yeah. Past. Or right, not, to, right. not to trash all the people who made that, but right, I I'm, right. I can or a twenty twenty seven dresses is it like twenty seven dresses is is pretty good as far as those ones go, but yeah yeah like that whole yeah. era I used to just crush all those they're very easy watching you know they're gonna hit those totally. like they each one of them has like one really memorable scene like Benny and the Jets and twenty seven dresses right. we're like oh, right. this is the shit like I'm having a right. good time now yeah yeah dude. Fool's uh McConaughey, his his whole you know wrong like Fool's yeah. Gold. Fool's Gold was huge for me, mostly yeah. because of his. Tan, I've never seen but... that one. That's funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, but really, like how to lose a guy in ten days, uh, and like uh, that's a great yeah. one. All those kinds of yeah. like I you know I was I was in that like you know teen that teen zone, so I was really vibing with those. Uh, totally. Up. No, those are yeah. those are really, those are really fun, and and um, and yeah, you know, and for me, it's it's fun to try to figure out how to kind of split the difference between stuff like that and and yeah. stuff that's like on the kind of sadder or like know, John Cassavetes or something. And, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's like definitely the extreme. Um, and you know, and I love stuff like that. But yeah, definitely, definitely like I feel safe saying the the midpoint between How to Lose a Guy in Ten Days and Cassavetes is the <laughs> right. Um, that's, is a the good, goal. that's a good sweet spot. I did, that's yeah. the goal. When, yeah. when I first saw Cassavetti's like a, a woman under the influence, it was so, yeah, it, it blew me away so hard. It made me feel like every other movie was just fake. But then right. as I've gotten more right. distance from seeing it, I'm like, I don't know if I want to be watching that all the time. Like totally. I'm, I'm more fragile now. Now that I'm in like my thirties, I can't, me and Chad were talking about this day. We can't watch stuff that's like hardcore sad because it'll, it'll fuck me up for the whole day. So I gotta, right. I gotta be right. careful with that shit. Totally. Yeah, no, I know what you mean. And I think, you know, with something like that, you kind of just watch it. And, you know, like for me, it's like, I watch them and I got kind of, you know, just like with my mouth open, cause it's just crazy that it exists. Um, but then as you say, it doesn't have like a high rewatchability factor. So then I kind of, you know, I find myself like as much as I love stuff like that, I then I'm watching like, you know, Coen Brothers movies over and over again or action movies or whatever. Yeah. Uh, and, and with, with Love Life uh, for each season, they, it's, a, it's a different protagonist, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. And then, that's yeah. cool. Um, you. Can you can you divulge any information on the next season, or is it all kind of yeah, confidential? Yeah, I mean, so no, I mean, you know, we have we we have announced um, the lead of the new season is going to be this actor William Jackson Harper, who plays Cheaty on The Good Place, and um, oh, he's great. I just watched the first yeah. season. Yeah, oh, yeah, nice. he's he's amazing, and so um, so he's going to play the lead. You know, I'm really excited just on you know on the first level that it's going to be a guy i think that'll be really fun it'll make the show feel you know i think the show will have the same kind of feelings and the same sweetness but the stories will be really different and mm -hmm. um and you know and also i think he's just such an amazing actor and he's so good on the good place um you know but that's also a pretty specific tone and a kind of different kind of thing so i'm excited mm -hmm. to be able to be able to kind of work with him 
in, in, you know, what I, I think is kind of his first like lead role like that, where it's kind of on his shoulders and, and he's carrying the thing. And I think, you know, he's, he's going to be so good. I'm so excited to, I just feel lucky to be able to be the person that gets to make that thing. Um, in a slower mm-hmm. clip. It'll, it'll be, it's kind of like yeah. a uh, more settled kind of, it's not sitcom that way. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, so I think it'll be fun. Um, it'll be fun to kind of, you know, show another side of him. Cause also just as a real guy, he's, you know, he's such a kind of smart and, and sweet and sensitive and funny and cool dude. Um, mm. You know, and his character on that show is, is hilarious and, and great, but it's definitely like a, a very specific thing. Um, that's kind of not really who he is. And, uh, and so, yeah, so, so it's, it's going to, it's going to follow a character played by William Jackson Harper. It's going to be in New York again. Um, one of the ideas from the beginning too, in addition to kind of following a new character every season was that I wanted it to feel like almost a shared universe where you're kind mm. of able from season to season to have, have people, um, you know, have, have it like intertwine with, for in this case, season one. Um, and I think especially where we're mm. like so specific, we're so specific with the timeline where it's like, you know, season one came out this year, but like, it starts in 2012 and we see like Lynn sanity and we see when, you know, kind of go all the way through all this stuff that's happened in like the last, you know, eight or 10 years or whatever. Um, and to have been that specific and now be able to kind of come back through that and like follow this new guy who's in New York, who, you know, we actually kind of pick up on his story in like 2015. And then we're looking at kind of the last, you know, five or six years um, and, you know, being able to see like, you know, have him again, kind of intersect with Darby, like at different points in her story or, you know, get, get to see certain characters again and have them kind of float in and out. Um, oh, nice. And, you know, and, and just, yeah. And just kind of wanting to make it feel like, you know, Oh, we were following this one person. And then, you know, now we're following someone who, you know, lived down the block from them or we're kind of, you know, just that feeling, I think, especially in New York where there's kind of so many people and so many, so many lives, so many stories and, and, they're kind of all buzzing parallel and, and yeah. uh, get, get the jump around like that. How's the, writer, so cool. how's the writer's room when everyone is everyone just telling like their worst date stories. And then <laughs> that's kind of the yeah. point. Yeah, no, the, the writer's room is great. And you know, both years, the writer's room has been, been great. And there's definitely a lot of that. I mean, I think for me too, especially like just, there is something about a thing that really happened. That's just always going to be better than anything we can make up. And, and, you know, and, and that's, what's fun about it too, I think is like, I don't even care so much. It's not like, oh, I'm just writing my own experiences as much as I just, like, I don't want, it doesn't necessarily have to be something that happened to me, but I just want it to be something that happened to someone. Mm-hmm. And, and kind of, you know, again, just the way that real life lays out with really, you know, not every story, but I think kind of the best, the best stories and the craziest things that happen to people there's just a specificity to that, that you can kind of never, um, you know, you can never fake. And, and I think even when stuff ends up kind of changing and, you know, a lot of the time we'll start with someone's story and it'll kind of morph or, or we'll adjust it to kind of tailor it to the story we're telling. Um, but like that kind of, that, that base is always there. That baseline is always there. And, and, you know, for me, at least you can kind of always feel it. There's just like a, a weird kind of, you know, couldn't, couldn't write that feeling that i'm always chasing well what was it like writing you know for uh an episode that took place in 2012 because I, I, yeah. I was i was watching yeah. out and i saw like you know the linsanity and all that kind of right. stuff and i was like i was like oh interesting like i, I wonder what it'd be like to rate to write for something that happened you know eight years ago right because it's sort of like it's like it feels like a very in-between moment of like you know there's the like, 2000s are so clear but then like yeah it's yeah. like a yeah did yeah, I mean, you know, feel there, yeah. Different? yeah, yeah. No, it, it definitely was different. I mean, I, I had a lot of fun with it because I also, I mean, that was even, I think, a network note at one point was like, why don't we do it in like a more fun decade or whatever? But there was something to me about the kind of like just the recent past, the kind of like indiscernibly recent past, but also, as I was saying, kind of being able to be so specific about it. And, mm-hmm. and, um, and I think, you know, like for me, like that's the year I graduated college. So I think a lot mm-hmm. of it was like just reverse engineered from that where it was like, you know, Oh, you know, when I was coming up with the idea for the show, it was, I also knew like, Oh, we're going to jump through time. And so, you know, the way, you know, 
it's, most shows don't do that. You know, you're kind of watching characters at one point in time and it's all, it's all linear, you know, but in this show, we are kind of jumping through almost like the highlight reel of, of each character's life, each main character's life. And, you know, so I was sort of like, okay, if we want to see this person over like eight years, if we're looking at someone's twenties, you know, and then it's sort of like, oh, let's start it in 2012. And then you can kind of work your way towards like the present so that it kind of ends like when you're watching the show, basically, was kind of something I thought would be fun. Um, and then, you know, with, with the pilot, which I wrote kind of before we sold the show, and it was the thing that got the show made, um, you know, it was fun to just, I just remembered, it's like, oh, you know, 2012, I was in New York, and just remembering what it felt like to be in those bars where everyone was, you know, freaking out over the, over the Jeremy Lin games and, and um, you know, just kind of like remembering all that stuff. A lot of that kind of just came from my own life and, and was pretty easy mm -hmm. to square away. And then as we went, you know, it was kind of like, oh, let's, let's figure out what the stories are that we want to tell. And then let's kind of weave in as, you know, as many little details as possible and, you know, and figuring out how to deal with certain stuff where it's like, you know, okay, like in, you know, 2016, which we, you know, moved through in, in, in season one, like Trump got elected. And, you know, there were times where we almost did like an election day episode or something like that, but we ultimately, there's like a minor acknowledgement of it. So you kind of know it's, you know, Mitt Romney, our world yeah. and yeah, yeah, there's the Romney stuff. And then at one point, I mean, this is even this is so subtle, I'm sure no one notices this, but like at one point, Anna's on her phone in one of the magnus episodes and like she's reading an article about like hillary and trump or something a picture of that but mm. but um, Dude, your your phone details were so good because when she's texting <laughs> magnus one time the text yeah. above says yours is better and it's a picture of like a salad right right so right indicative of their relationship that she's constantly having to like boost his ego and keep Thank him you, good and seeing that detail on that phone i was like like it was just very comprehensive thinking on your guys's part thank you no i'm i'm, I'm glad to hear that i mean it's a funny thing because you sort of there's so many things going on when you're, when you're making something, you know, when you're in production and stuff like that often kind of falls to the wayside. And I've, you know, it, it, that literally came from directing other stuff before where I didn't think to, you know, I didn't think ahead on that. And then I'm like watching the footage later and it's like some insert of some text and you're kind of reading the text you're supposed to be reading, but then you look above it and it's just like bullshit that like they put in the phone that like doesn't feel real at all so it's like right. hi how are you like i am fine you know or whatever. <laughs> um and so you know it was fun to kind of like put in those details that you know again most people won't notice but but they're there and, and is that in the script or is that like is that on set you're telling like the props department you're like hey yeah you the text kind of no something like that's more like more when you're in production and you know, you would just have probably like in the script would be like the text that you're supposed to read. That's like part of the scene. And then the stuff above it would be the props department when they're actually like rigging, rigging the phone. And, and, um, and yeah, and, you know, and that was a fun thing too, where it was like, again, minor details, but it's like, okay, if we're going, you know, 2012 to 2020 in this first season, you know, like when does she get a new iPhone and what's the, you know, what iPhone was out then and what's, you know, even just, I mean, whatever, that's like a, that's like a minor thing, the iPhone, but just, just the little ways that kind of our lives have changed over that period of time and, and all that kind of stuff. And the mm -hmm. music. I mean, the music Thank was uh, so uh, well picked sometimes for the moment. And then sometimes it's just like, like uh, I got into this uh, singer, Arthur Russell, my friend showed him to me. Yeah. And yeah. You end, I think you end episode one with one of his songs. Yeah. Yeah. But, but that's not really like a, a time period thing, right? Was that just, he's just an artist who really spoke to you? Yeah. I mean, it's a mix. Like I, I, you know, I picked all the songs in the show and it was, it's like, that's honestly one of my favorite things. I mean, even now we're in, still in like the pretty early stages of writing season two. Um, but I'm already kind of thinking about music and thinking about songs that we can use. And, and I like to have it be kind of a balance where like there are certain instances where we're using it to kind of mark time and to take people back to a certain moment. And then other instances where it's something a little more timeless where I'm just like, you know, in, in the example that you brought up the Arthur Russell song, like, you know, that's, that's, um, you know, that's an older piece of music that I just thought would be kind of amazing to that moment. But then like in the Danny two phones episode when they're, you know, like, getting out on that roof for the, for the, the roof party. It's like, Oh, what was, you know, the summer of 2015. Yeah. It's like, what was the Fetty song? That was like the, you know, six, seven, nine or whatever that big yeah. song was. That song, man. And yeah. 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 Or, you know, and sort of the kind of, uh, you know, the, the time a mix of the, of the kind of balance of the timely and the timeless and having like Fetty Wap and, you know, 
um, Egyptian and stuff like that on the soundtrack. And, but, and then know. the the John Mayer song. I've listened to that. That song's in my <laughs> top ten of the year played since that came on. And I know of all the music, that's hilarious. That one stuck with me the most. For some, maybe it's because of what the character is going through at the moment. But that song, uh, I don't know. It's had a long uh, after. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that was a funny one where that was. You know, to be honest, like that episode is actually based on, you know, something that happened to my wife. And that was like, that was like the real song that was kind of part of the story. And Wait, so was your wife, so, like so for, for the listeners, the episode is <laughs> yeah. about uh, the protagonist fakes cancer because she's so embarrassed over how heartbroken right. she is. She right. tells everyone she's actually sad because she has cancer. And right. that, so do you mind me prying? Was that? No, was that yeah, yeah. No, story? I brought it up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that was something that was like a story that with my wife, I had ha- kind of, you know, known that was something that had happened to her. And it was obviously something she's kind of, you know, she was embarrassed about, but I, it just always made me feel closer to her. Not, not like sorry for her, but it just was like, it was just like, it made me feel closer to her to like, imagine her feeling like she had to do that. And there was just something right. that felt so kind of sweet about it and imagining like wishing that I could have like, that I could like talk to like that version of her and be like, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to pull moves like this, but, but, you know, I think it, it was something we thought would be interesting and just kind of a, again, something that, you know, we couldn't like, you know, it would just be tough to go in the writer's room and pitch like, what if she fakes cancer and have that be out of nowhere, you know, kind of mm. stuff like that usually does come from real life from, from someone's real life. Um, and so, yeah. So in that episode, I think especially like, I hewed pretty closely to the details of the real story, including that John Mayer song, which, which she kind of like listened to on a loop. And uh, Hmm. I'm glad she had that song to help her through that. I I like what you're saying too, about how you're almost, you almost like someone more when they share something like that with you, because you totally understand the emotions that motivated that kind of irrational decision. And then the fact that they went through that and you know, they're a good person and that they share that with you. Yeah. It's kind of like the best part of relationships for me is like definitely definitely. kind of bonding over the mutual. uh, I don't want to be like, like bonding over the mutual kind of a mad person or lunatic that lives (laughs) in all of our brains. Totally. Yeah. And I think especially when it's like something that happened to someone when they were a kid, it's like, if you're 16, just like everyone does such dumb shit when they're a teenager and like, you know, and, and, and so, you know, I think so much of the stuff people do when they're a teenager is just because they're, they're in this kind of like, you know, free fall of like trying to figure out who they are and, and just doing and saying insane stuff. So I think there was like, especially just like imagining kind of the teen version of her going through that, you know, it was, Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, just something that I kind of always, you know, it was a story that stuck with me. Did she like the episode? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think obviously like, I kind of did it also as, as like sort of a love letter to her and, 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 you know, but I think for her, you know, I'm sure it's like a trip and, and, you know, I think, I think it's obviously complicated and even like, you know, my in-laws and stuff watched it and like felt so bad in retrospect and, you know, kind of a way that they had never, <clears throat> you know, like talked to her about it before because they kind of just didn't talk about it since, since it happened since she was a kid. And, um, and, you know, but, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, she, she loved it and she was kind of the one telling me all the details and, and, you know, and, and, and I'm kind of detail obsessed so that it was that thing of like, you know, you know, even down, you know, the music and stuff like that. But I think especially for that one where it's 2006, like getting the, getting like the eyesight that goes on top of your camera and the, you know, top of your computer and the, you know, the like old green iPod and all that stuff, bringing all that stuff back was really fun. And, you know, mm. Yeah. What's what's your writing process like when you're not in a writer's room? Like when you're writing a pilot, for example. Like, yeah. are you the kind of writer who like wakes up and you're like, I'm gonna do two hours of writing a day, or or do you <laughs> let the inspiration come to you? Like, how how do you? Yeah, I mean, process? it's funny. Like, I've I've tried. You know, there's a lot of different ways, and I think it's just different for everyone. It's you know, it's it's. Um, but for me, like when I when I wrote the pilot, like I I do think when I'm on my own. Um, I do writing kind of fits and starts and it's hard for me to like, you know, I think I need to get better at, at like the kind of treating it like a day job and making myself right way of doing things. But like, if I'm being honest, the way that like the stuff I've written, that's actually any good kind of came to me. It was in these bursts of like, you mm-hmm. know, 
thinking and thinking and thinking about something for a long time and kind of writing a bullshit version or, you know, like chipping away at it. And then it kind of just, you know, I think especially in the case of the Love Life pilot, like came to me um, pretty quickly. And, um, you know, and now that I'm in, you know, now that like we actually are making it a show and having been through season one and now writing season two, like it's a whole different situation that, you know, I, I, I think is way, you know, I, I love it. I mean, I just, it's so hard to write alone. And I think um, being able to work with people in the room and, and talk through everything so much before you're even really writing, you know, I think, I think that's the difference too, was like, you know, really like, I think stuff is best when you're kind of like, you've talked it all through and you've figured, out, figured it all out so much, whether it's an outline or on, you know, a, a you know, a whiteboard or whatever, you, you've figured it out to like such a kind of comprehensive level that like the writing of the thing is actually just kind of a technicality <laughs> at that point. Yeah. You know? um, and I kind of always was the opposite in a way that was pretty arduous where like, I was just, I would always go kind of straight to like final draft and I would be like writing and writing and writing, but nothing you're going to write is going to be kind of any good until you figure that big stuff out. So um, anyway, all, all that's to say, yeah. like I definitely always was kind of a, you know, did, did it by myself and did it in this pretty unstructured and undisciplined way. Um, and I'm, you know, lucky to have learned a better way to do it now. Yeah. It's, it's tough to, uh, to, to, to approach it sort of out, you know, structure first outline, you know, get the story structure in because you just want like, uh, like with when we're writing and stuff, like the dialogue's so much fun and it's just like, yeah, you have to just get through all these hurdles to get to that point. And it's, uh, right. It's, uh, but it's fun. But yeah, no, I hear what you're saying too. Like writing, you know, stand up. it's, uh, you know, I, I, when I started, I would try to write for, you know, hour, a couple, like an hour a day or something. But right. like, like you were saying, a lot of times it's it just like the best idea is just, you know, it's when you get that flow state where you just like, right. Like come to you and you're just like writing it out. And then you kind of like, it's like a very brief moment in time. And, uh, totally. So totally. yeah, and, yeah. And it's like, you can't force that. You just have to let that flow through you um totally so, yeah yeah we're, we're we're writing a pilot right now and we're dealing with like these logic log jams where we have to like change things but it, right. i don't think people realize like the ripple effects that small changes have in a script and like how yeah. carefully constructed everything is so right. like we we spent two hours today just staring at each other over zoom yeah yeah <laughs> like, it happens like, yeah it fell asleep yeah yeah, yeah Jet was like, I'm gonna lay down. I think I had nine graham crackers, and then yeah. uh, we just and but but you're genuinely working. But the right the if you looked at what was tangibly created afterwards, it would be very right. hard to measure. But yeah, yeah, no, and I think that's how it goes for for anyone. You know, it's like there there's so much kind of time that feels wasted, or 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 you know stuff that seems like um, you know you're not actually working. And, uh, you know, I, I feel, I'm glad that, uh, you know, that we sold the show and got to make it and stuff. Cause I think when I was, you know, before that, when I would be like working all the time and writing, you know, my wife would always be like, she didn't understand that I was working, even though I was just like sitting around, like, it looked like I was, you know, like just like a, a total, you know, dipshit loser. I don't understand yeah. that I'm working. You know? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to describe it. I'm just like, yeah, like, chilling, but it's stressful. Yeah, like yeah, that's it, man. That's, that's, the, that's the yeah. name of the game. How was pitching yeah. it? Like, was it? Uh, do you like pitching stuff? Um, I don't really. Um, uh, I don't really like pitching stuff. I mean, I think it's it's sort of a necessary evil. I think in the case of this show, I was lucky. Um, you believed in it so much, or the pilot? Yeah, and so well, good. yeah. Well, I had written the pilot, and people like that, so that kind of like got that helped a lot, and then. You know, I think uh, like it was fun pitching it, but it's definitely like it's not the thing I would choose to do. It's not my favorite part of it. Um, but you know, but I think also part of it is like a lot of people think that like you can just kind of pitch some half baked idea or whatever. And I think with this, it was like a case where I had written the pilot and I had kind of made this like lookbook thing um, that was pretty comprehensive and kind of gave a sense of like what the show would feel like and all this stuff coming at it kind of as more as a director. Um, and so anyone I sat down with, you know, got a, I think a pretty clear, um, for better or worse, like a pretty clear sense of, of what I wanted to do with the thing. Um, 
And, and, you know, and I think a lot of that was me wanting to kind of do as much work as possible to, to kind of prove the, you know, prove the viability of, of the idea and of the show. And um, yeah. And then how do, how do you, uh, how do you, how do you foster creativity in the writer's room? So everyone's like at their top kind of like generating self idea generating. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It's like, you know, running a writer's room or running a, you know, a set, um, a lot of it's, you know, it's, 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 it's kind of like any, any like managerial thing where it's like, whether you're like coaching a baseball team or you're whatever it is, like you're, you're, kind of trying to get the best out of people and you want them to feel, you know, in my case, the way that I do it, like it's always kind of wanting them to feel like, you know, wanting them to know that, that they're kind of true collaborators in it and that I'm not kind of precious about anything. There's no ego with it. So it's like all of us coming together to try to make the best thing possible. But then you also are trying to, you know, you still need to like be in charge. Yeah. Have the confidence and have the kind of drive to like, keep the whole thing on the rails. And it's, you know, that's, that's the trick of it is trying to find that balance where like, you know, it's, it's not this kind of like, you know, rudderless ship, but, but you're also, you know, all kind of free and, and able to, you know, come up with stuff or or take the time that it takes to, to figure out what's really good. Yeah. Uh, I, I saw that you worked with Sasha Baron Cohen on the dictator. (laughs) um what what was that like and what what were you doing uh were you on set or were you in the room like how how did you yeah that that was a that was a job I was super lucky to have that gig when I was at NYU in film school and it was like a summer um and I was his assistant just on set of that movie so I was like on set with him every day and and it was amazing I mean I think you know it's funny like I think back to that time in my life and it feels like yeah I think that was actually I think the movie came out in 20. 12 we shot in 2011 but that is the kind of time in my life that i was thinking about when i was doing season one of the show mm-hmm. and you know and it's i mean it's like anything where you kind of look back i think it's weird too like you get into your 30s and it's the first time you can kind of really like look back on any part of your adult life you know um mm-hmm. and and it feels weird to be kind of so far away from that but but it was an amazing time and it was like a super it was just a, you know a really fun um you know, summer job obviously is an understatement, but like, but, um, but I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I, I got to, I got to kind of see so much and it was, it was a really fun movie to be a part of. Yeah. He, he's amazing. We're, we're, yeah. We're, yeah. we're buddies with, uh, one of his main guys, Austin Sokol. Oh, cool. you say last name. Do you know, do you know Austin? I, I don't know Austin. Um, but you know, it, it's been like, whatever now eight or ten years since i worked since right. i worked for sasha so yeah um but that's he's cool. still out there too he's still risking it all for the, i know for the i know and the, 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 the borat too is pretty amazing yeah yeah awesome. yeah that was pretty incredible um yeah. so there there was a i'm sorry i'm gonna go personal here but there was some narration no, on top good. of the whole show yeah uh, yeah the narrator had a really lovely voice kind of like an emma thompson kind of uh, <laughs> thank you yeah. yeah and uh smart to go British too. Cause I think it adds a level of, a uh, authority. Class, a little bit of, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Um, but she says that the average person has seven relationships before they marry falls in love twice mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. has their heart broken twice, which means they, they were unlucky in those falling in love situations. Were those right. real statistics or was that kind of just an approximation that you saw in the world? No, it's such a funny thing. Cause it's like, I honestly, it's hard for me to remember. It might be like uh, there might have been real statistics that we used as kind of a departure point, um, like but I think even I'm not I'm not sure uh, That's my I'm not sure where they were from. I don't know that one, but um, but yeah, I don't. I mean, even more. I think with that too, it always more than like whatever the specific statistics were. It was just kind of trying to give the audience a sense of like you know we're, it, it was sort of like oh we're going to kind of reduce a person's life to like these. Right. milestones or these or these kind of these kind of chunks this of their is how life we're diagramming and, it out yeah yeah we're, so it was sort of like it was never as much about like the actual numbers it was kind of like oh do we have like a version of that that feels real at all and sounds nice or um yeah but so were you a big dater in your in your 20s um and i i started dating my now wife um 
uh, when we were 25. So like the back half of my twenties was just with her. Um, I oh, definitely, so you, got, you, know, you got out pretty early. I did. Yeah. I got out pretty early. Um, and that's the thing. Maybe that's like, you know, um, I don't know. It's a part of why I'm bored with like romantic comedies. And I think probably like earlier in my twenties, I was like trying to understand love and, and trying to like figure that whole thing out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I definitely, you know, I definitely like dated in my early twenties and, and, um, you know, most of it was just like embarrassing and, and, and silly and, you know, good amount of that's in the show. Did any of your exes like Facebook message you after the show? <laughs> and they were like, Hey, that thing that Augie did. <laughs> right. No, actually no one, no one reached out. I had one, there's one thing I got, uh, like a friend who was kind of was mad that I used like a detail from their life, but, but it wasn't an ex of mine and everything else was, mm. was no one else said anything or you just, you just got to hide it well enough, you know? Yeah. yeah. I heard Truman Capote, his second book after in cold blood, he was like tearing down all these New York socialites, but he like barely changed their names and he thought, uh -huh. like, right. I guess he was drunk all the time. And then when the right. book came out, he couldn't get invited right. to brunch till like the end of his life, basically. Right. Right. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, they, 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 in the pilot, um, that first argument was, uh, it, it was, it, it like struck me so deeply. I think I'm like, oh, I'm like, I've had this exact same conversation. <laughs> yeah. Just like, oh, <clears throat> I don't know. It was just the, the it just felt so real. <clears throat> Thank you, man. So I just, yeah, it was just so, uh, yeah, the, the, the show is so, it's so relatable and it, yeah, it's just great. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, and it was. I yeah. thought Anna Kendrick was. I called her Anna at the beginning. I think I was trying to sound. It's a, all good. Is, yeah. it, is it? Is it Anna or the other? Is it, it Anna? Anna? It's, it's it's Anna. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. I'll I'll soften that A inflection. Uh, <laughs> so Anna, she's so good in this show. She has yeah. this unbelievable. She's amazing. She can be like pithy, but so real at the same time. So it's like yeah. the joke hits, but it still feels very much like a real person saying it. Which is totally. I don't know. I think it's pretty hard to do. But how did your yeah. guys' relationship evolve, and how influential was she in kind of shaping the arc of the character? Yeah, it was. You know, we had a great time working together, and and she was. You know, I had, I had written the pilot obviously, and kind of built the beginnings of the character. But as far as the arc of it, like she was a huge part of kind of figuring out where we wanted to go with it, and and helping shape certain things. She's super super smart, and um, just you know she has such good instincts and, uh, and yeah, I mean, I think you put it really well that she, she does have a, a pretty uncanny ability to like, to hit that balance. Um, and yeah, you know, she and I would just have kind of long talks and hangs where, you know, we would it, not unlike the writer's room, we kind of just like talk about our relationships, talk about, you know, and you know, our, our feelings and all that stuff and see what sticks. She wore you guys do like after the episode chats, which were really uh -huh. informative. And she wore a backwards cap, and she it, did. Was, it kind of threw me off. But then I was like, Oh, is she doing it as homage to Sam? Because you're wearing a hat. So I was like, <laughs> Did you right. wear a hat on set all the time? And then she was like, All right, I'll do this during the director's conversation. Yeah, I wear hats a lot. And then she, I was wearing a hat in that. And then she was kind of making fun of me. And the first person I ever asked about that, and possibly the only person I ever noticed, but she, um. <laughs> she was like, she was like fucking with me. Cause it was basically just like, yeah. 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 I was wearing a hat and she was just kind of making fun of me. Cause she was, I remember what she said was like, cause all the, we did that whole press thing and all the women had kind of gone through like all of this, like serious, like hair and makeup and styling and, and all this stuff. And then she was like, Oh, like, I guess we, you know, are wearing what we're wearing and Sam gets to wear exactly what he wears every day. <laughs> and, uh, and then she just like, she had a hat and put it on and, and then I think no one like said shit. And I was kind of worried they were gonna like make us reshoot the things or something because it was distracting, but but it was it, was it wasn't there. I don't know why it was, but it did distract me. But then I realized I was like, oh well, I think she's kind of having she was probably like, well, I'm yeah. gonna have fun with the whole process. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, then, yeah, exactly. And then Paul Feig was in there too, who I'm a big yeah. fan of, who people probably know from he had a great part in heavyweights, and then he created Freaks and Geeks and then <laughs> Spy and Bridesmaids. Yeah. So was he he was a producer on it? Yeah, he was he he was the producer and and you know Paul's great. I mean, Freaks and Geeks is one of my favorite shows ever, and was definitely has you know it's been a big influence on me in general, but on this show too, especially and and Bridesmaids is so good and and uh, you know it was awesome 
getting to work with him. How, what was your sort of path uh, into the industry? Like, what were you working, um, you know, on the industry side, like on set at all? Or were you just sort of like, I'm a writer and you're working, breaking your way yeah. that way? You know, I made a bunch of shorts in high school. And then I kind of, um, uh, you know, I went to NYU for film school. And so I was always kind of making stuff, um, but making shorts like pretty low budget so that it was low stakes and I could kind of just fuck around and, and learn um yeah. and then i made um i made a short called in relationship that became you know i expanded into my first feature um and kind of all that was earlier in my 20s and kind of as that was happening as i was making the short and then trying to get the feature made i was working like assistant jobs like you know the first big one was working for software and co and as you as you mentioned but you know like mm -hmm. working for a director or for a director for a couple of years and and just tried to kind of be on every set that I could and, Is and it a director we'd know? see as much, as much as I could. Um, it's a guy named Rob Letterman. who's a super nice guy who directed um, uh, the Goosebumps movie, which was what I worked on for. Which oh, no, really cool. Really fun. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Um, it's a big budge. You were on like yeah. a big set with like a hundred people. Yeah. Yeah. It was fun. It was fun to kind of see, you know, see like high level kind of blockbuster shit like that and how it goes down. Mm -hmm. Oh, there was this, I think there, you guys did such a good job of having like iconic lines in kind of each episode <laughs> that really kind of distilled down what the episode was about. And I think, I think my favorite is episode two, Anna Kendrick's character Darby is dating her old boss and you guys are very <laughs> uh, kind to him and you don't make him a creep, which was kind of like, uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, like was when they first hooked up, I was like, oh shit, oh no. But then it ends up being like a little bit more wholesome. And, but she goes to yeah. his dad's funeral. She gets drunk. She makes a scene. And then when right. they're driving home, she's being needy and she's like, Hey, you're not, you're not mad at me. Are you? And he goes, I'm not mad. My dad's dead. Yeah. <laughs> That's That one makes me laugh too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Scoot McNary is such a good actor too, but yeah, just the he's way awesome. he kind of, just the way he reoriented everything. Like he's like, look, no, like you're all in your own shit. You're not thinking about anything that's actually happening. Uh, yeah. How, well, yeah. When, when you land on a line like that, do you know it's going to be kind of like such a clincher for the episode? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's not something where we're kind of trying to encapsulate anything, but I think, you know, every once in a while you get a line like that and it's just so funny and and it does kind of hit on what you're what you're trying to get at. I think especially with that AirPod down. Um, especially with that episode and kind of earlier in the season, like it was fun to go like, okay, if we're starting with this person kind of, you know, um, on on the younger side, like they're going to do dumb shit and kind of, you know, when you're, when you're watching a normal show that kind of stays in one period of time, if the person's an asshole, you're kind of just like with that person the whole time, but because we're able to kind of jump through it, you can kind of have her, you know, have any of these main characters kind of make mistakes that then you get to, you know, jump, jump ahead and, and you're with some other version of them where they've kind of learned a little more. Or they're like a little less shitty and, and and that was really fun for us to be able to have her just like totally like tank that and in a way that hopefully doesn't like turn, you know, turn people off of the character. But again, it's like, even when I was talking about the story with my wife and how it kind of made me feel closer to her, it's like, I, I became really interested in kind of looking back on your own life and kind of hoping that people would watch the show and then kind of think back on their own life and stuff that happened to them and, and, you know, dumb shit that, everybody does and 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 yeah that that line definitely just always made me laugh as a as a uh you know a, a pretty i don't know a pretty concise encapsulation of that that story yeah it was great mm. are, are you worried about like a new media kind of supplanting um traditional television at all like we just got on tiktok and we've been sure yeah. on there dancing you can right. check out our account and horny uh, we're, we're trying to check it out because we, we, we realize a lot of the young people on there are really, they're just horny. And there's not right. a lot of super like, horny. There's not a lot of right. 30 somethings representing the horny demographic, but you know, we're still right. horny too. Um, right. Crazy do you, horny. Do you at all worry about <laughs> these kind of, do you worry about like nobody watching TV at some point and all just being like TikTok viewing? Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it's definitely like headed in that direction, but I also think already people, like not even just the people who are young enough to like, be most of the people on TikTok, but like, I think phones have just fucked all of our attention spans. And I think, you know, all of it, I mean, it's a funny thing. Cause it's like, 
you just think back through time. It's like, we're always just like wanting, we're just wanting like more and more stuff to, it's all just shit to look at. You know what I mean? It's all just like, we're all just trying mm-hmm. to like fill time and it's all shit to look at. And so it's like, yeah, like now it's TikTok, And before that it was TV and before that it was movies and before that it was books. And before that it was like staring at a fire or something or like looking in the middle distance or whatever, but like, you know, or we're looking to play, but it, you know, I think, you know, I obviously love, um, I guess my answer would be that like, I personally, you know, love TV and I love movies, but I also know they've only been around for like, you know, whatever, like, or something. you know, yeah, six, 60 and a hundred years respectively. And, and that it all changes. And that like, you know, me sitting here being like, Oh, like, but what about TV shows? When, like, when I grew up, it was like, Oh, like, can't watch TV. It rots your brain. Like, you know, and now mm. it's like pre- prestige or whatever, like, right. it just all, ch- it all changes. And it's always like, it's like, oh, like I personally can love certain stuff or love stories that are told a certain way. And I also just don't want to be like the old guy, like yelling in a cloud, like, you know, um, as you know, cause it's going to, it's going to change. And I think especially just with phones that, that sort of really accelerated the decline of everyone's attention spans, like myself included, you know. I mean, can you experience boredom? Mm-hmm. Are you able to like sit in boredom without stimuli? stimulation um i personally like have um i just get stuck i'll just get stuck in my own head usually if i'm you know not like if there's no other stimuli i'll just i'll just be like overthinking stuff so for me it's a little harder to to slow down you know i i like to try but but it's it's hard i think especially with making a show and stuff there's kind of just always something to think about and always something to you know Right, you could always out. be you yeah. could always be improving or, or working on something or fixing something. Right. right. So are you how do you how do you relax? What do you get up to? Um, you know, I just like hang with my wife. I mean, I think especially in quarantine, it's like we just, you know, we'll go on walks together or we'll um, you know, go go on little like road trips or something. But um but you know, I don't know. I mean I'll I'll to be honest, like a lot of my time just is spent either you know, with my wife and, and trying to be a real person and, and trying to relax or, you know, writing and kind of making and, and watching stuff. Hmm. Do you like the before sunrise series? Yeah. Yeah. Those ones are big for me. Those that's like definitely kind of one of the main things I was thinking about with this show and, and trying to hit that, that tonal balance, but also just like the way, you know, they did the real version of it, which is obviously way tighter than like the fake version where you shoot it all at once. But but, um, you know, jumping through time with characters like that, I think is really awesome. Yeah. I've been thinking about that movie a lot lately. I just, I just showed my, I'm in a new relationship and I was showing my girlfriend the first one and she's nice. a little more cynical about romance movies, which is kind of a fun yeah. balance for us. And then I was thinking about the second one about how he writes that book just so right. he'll potentially meet her again, right. which I totally related right. to because I'm, totally. I'm like that. I'm like, no, I'll do something crazy and just the hopes that it'll pay off like in a yeah. romantic way. But then yeah. you were just talking about like, which is trying to be a normal person. It reminded me of Ethan Hawke's character in the third one where he's like, he, he reads her that letter that he writes her and he's like, as someone who's always struggled to be present, but he doesn't right. feel that way to me as a character, but it's interesting that it must right. be different for him on the interior. But Definitely. Like, is, yeah. Is it hard? Is it hard for you when you're running a show and you're, you're thinking about it like creatively, logistically, producerially, and then you're also just like, going to you know, go hang out with people and be mellow. Is it hard to, right. to kind of switch it off, I guess? Definitely. Yeah. I have a really hard time with that. And I, and I'm trying to find more of a balance, but you know, but it's tough. Cause it's like when you're really in something, you know, at least for me, like I just am always thinking about it and, 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 you know, as I was just saying, like always trying to figure, always trying to figure some new thing out. Um, but that's why it's good too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely. Why, but you know, good. yeah, well, thank you. But you know, but it's also like, you kind of want to, you got to find the balance of like, you know, life and work and, all that stuff, mm-hmm. which I'm trying to. Yeah. Are, are you able to like disconnect it all and like go out with friends or, uh, cause I'm kind of like, I have that same thing where I just want to be working all the time and people are like, Hey, let, you know, let's go hang out. Let's go get dinner. I'm like, right. that sounds like the worst thing on earth yeah. right now. No, <laughs> like, it's hard. I, it's I hard. I mean, anything, I'd rather do less. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, no, um, no. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I try to, but yeah, it can, it can be hard. I mean, I think, yeah it just you know it just depends i think especially in this situation where like once the show's up and running i'm so in it that i kind of have that as an excuse and i can really throw myself into that and you know when we were yeah. running the show i mean i had, i had like it was before covid but like 
I had, you know, three dinners with people probably in like, you know, nine months or something. Cause you're just right. so in it. Um, yeah. and then to be honest, like my time since then has been in COVID. So it's sort of, that's got me off the hook too. in, in another <laughs> Right. Right. You got that shred stick yeah. back there. Are you surfing at all? Oh man. No, now I'm now, um, I'm going to be revealed as a poser. That actually is like my dad does, goes to like tons of flea markets and stuff like that and gave that to us just as like a thing to have around. And now it's a, uh, now it's just a thing that it's like people who have books they've never read in their house. Just a, yeah. a, a poser. Oh, dude, I don't know anything about that dog. There we go. I did have, <laughs> I did have a brief phase in middle school where I had a Doyle foam board that I tried to surf and then my dog actually literally ate it or tore it apart. So, Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a good meal for a dog. 10 foot, 10 feet of, pretty, a, of pretty good. Yeah. Pretty good. Yeah. Um, do you want to answer some listeners questions? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, let's knock some out. All right. Let's do this. Got a little, I got some, uh, we ordered some chicken tikka masala that I'm, I have inside. I'm oh, excited. We have lovely. that to work. We have that to work towards. Oh, nice. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, what up, Council? I am a SoCal surf rat and student, and my search for love is not going well. There is a babe in my science class that I've been texting for a month or two now. I really like her, but I can't seem to get her attention. For starters, she does not respond to anything like hey or hi. I can only start a convo by asking about class. Also, at a certain point, once we have started talking, she just disappears. She has told me that she thinks I'm really nice and I'm a good listener, but I don't know if that means anything for my pursuit of her. What do I do now? Do I keep slowly trying to get closer or do I just move on? Thanks, dudes. Hugs and kisses, Dave. It's a good question. Is this like a little kid or who is this person? <laughs> I, think he's a, I, think he's a, I think he's a dude in high school. And okay. um, he seems like, it's, like a real, it's a real person. It's not like a bit or something. It's no, no, this is real. Yeah. These people yeah. are real. Yeah. yeah. Dave is a real yeah. dude and he needs some real help. And <laughs> Got it. I'm sorry. I'll take it seriously. Well, <laughs> Dave, we're off we're off to a tough start here because I I thought you maybe were a bit, but I'm glad you're you're a real guy. And I think I don't know. I think you you just need to you just need to be yourself and and kind of try not to not to worry about it and not worry about her, not think about it too much. That was kind of my always that was always my problem when I was single was I kind of thought about it all too much and worried about it all too much. And then, you know, it's all just kind of happening in your own head and nothing's really happening in, in life or with the other person. So I think um, you just got to trust it and, and try to distract yourself. And, and if something's, you know, meant, meant to happen, then it'll just happen. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I'd say, you know, don't worry about it too much. Don't, don't put so much sort of, it seems like you're putting a lot of focus and attention on, on, on creating this, this thing. And I, and I was sort of, and in my mind, I was sort of like, like maybe like, you know, do something a little bit, like do something for yourself or, or invest in yourself a little bit, but do something sort of like off the wall that will grab her attention, but doesn't seem like, you know, like start break dancing in the quad. And right. that's like sort of like your thing, you know, if you become like good, like something like that, or if you become good at it, she's like, Said, wow i didn't realize you had so many moves and you're like oh yeah that, yeah it's kind of it's kind of my thing and then just like <laughs> then she'll be interested dude i feel you because it's like you're t- you're kind of talking <laughs> about peacocking but peacocking as right, like right. initially um written about was it felt very uh fake like it's like oh wear a fanny pack or wear a goofy hat but that's not yeah. really like a high value right. thing but knowing how to break dance yeah you know, right knowing how to be really legit at hacky sack those are things that actually have value. And so if you can, and actually take skills. So if, if you can work towards one of those things where you can really showcase yourself, I think that's uh, more authentic peacocking. I would also say, dude, that that's good um, advice. Yeah. sometimes we think relationships, we have an idea of how they're going to work out for us and what we're going to get in return, but real relationships never work out that way. There's always another person on the other end who has, who's going through their own life journey. And so if, even if she doesn't respond to you all the time, it's not a reflection of you. It's just, it's just, she's her own person and she's not always going to respond the way you want to. So the more you can like not live and die by each one of her responses, I think the more you'll actually get to know who she is. And then, and then you guys might work out if, if it's meant to be. Yeah. Totally. Um, managing go. a friendship with the ex. What up Stoke Lords? Uh, first off, I have to say JT, you look absolutely shredded in these new TikToks. Thank you, dog. 
Um, okay, getting into it. I was in a long-term relationship that ended last summer. I was having some mental health issues. She was very supportive, but I just needed to focus on myself. So we decided to take a step back. Basically, we've been trying to be friends, but there are definitely some lingering feelings that neither of us can kick. I recently started to see someone else. And although it's not very serious yet, I feel guilty about it because of the situation with my ex. I'm not sure if I should bring it up or wait to see if this relationship starts to develop into something more serious. I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, but I also don't want to feel guilty for starting a new relationship. And I definitely don't want to make this new girl feel uncomfortable with the dynamic of my friendship with my ex. What should I do? Do I wait to see if this other relationship develops? Do I put my focus on this new girl and let go of my ex completely? How do I handle this without hurting anyone or making anyone feel dumb? All good, all love and good vibes, Jay. Mm. It's a tough, it's a tough so one. He, what do you guys think? So, so he feels uh, guilty about starting a new relationship so soon after his ex. Is that what? No, no. He here? feels bad for his new girlfriend because he still has lingering feelings with his old oh. girlfriend, and she mm. also has lingering feelings. So he feels like he's kind of uh, not entering this new relationship in good faith because he's mm. kind of got he's playing two hands, and so he's he's saying yeah. like, hey. Do do I fold one hand and just and just go all in with with the hand uh, I'm I'm playing on this other table, um, and I think you know what you got to do, dude. You know, and look, we I, this is very normal, man. I'm I'm sorry you're going through this, but it's very normal, and a lot of people try to play both hands until they figure out which one is stronger, and then they and then they they don't fold until the river, if this is still making sense. They don't fold to the last second, but the the better thing to do the the move of integrity. And the move that won't get you kicked out of the casino, if that makes any sense. I don't know what the casino represents. You got to fold one of the hands and just try and go forward with this new girl. And you and the old girl probably broke up for a reason. I've gone back with an ex and it doesn't work. There's a reason you guys broke up. I, you know, there's times where it can work, but I think those are anomalous. I have nothing to add. Yeah, I agree that with that. Good. All right, dudes. All right, I'm going to be silent on this next one then, though. What up, Chad and JT? <laughs> First we should off, just make you answer all of them. <laughs> first off, thank you. I would do it too, dude. Uh, first off, thank you. I got I got that in me. First off, thank you so much for boosting the stoke for me with my GF, with the dank pod and all the great Instagram content. I'm a 20-year-old stoker who just basically realized that my ego is what's driving the issues in my life. Not a douchey show-off ego, more, but more of what I self-labeled superhero syndrome. Basically, I always think I can handle more than I should take on, which leaves me exhausted from a constant juggling act of different commitments, managing relationships, and deciding how to spend my time. This partially arises naturally living at home from college, now splitting time between each of my divorced parents and my girlfriend. But I also think raises my ego, but I also think my ego raises the anxiety because I always want to keep each of them happy and feeling like I spent enough time with them. Chad, I know you're a workaholic, and I'm curious if you ever feel like you stretch yourself too thin and how you deal with it. JT, I feel like you're constantly working at your ego, and I'd love how do you know to work on it without being too self-critical. Thanks, bros. Keep crushing. Oh, that was nice of you, Dave. Uh, what do we think? Uh, I think it's a good question. I think we were talking about it a little earlier, but it, it's definitely hard to find the balance. I don't know what your guys' mm -hmm. approach is, but I'm kind of always – it's just something I'm always working on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Yeah, I don't know. Like, none of us have found a solution, is what we're saying to this issue. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's this, true. I don't, know, I, don't I, there, I don't know that there is one. I think you gotta just I, keep at it. Yeah, yeah. One thing, one thing I I've found is um, that's really great is little rewards. You know, sometimes if if you if you feel like you're being so disciplined and like. Or you're trying, you try, you're kind of being hard on yourself. Where you're like, I got to keep working, or I got to keep, you know, uh, on like this diet or whatever it is. You know, it's like if you if you establish little rewards for yourself, you know, like you're like, oh, Friday I'm gonna get a McFlurry, um, you know, or I'm gonna reward reward myself with the Michael Jordan documentary or something like that. Um, so. Yeah, that 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 helps me a lot. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, I, I think, I think just being, re remembering to, to reward yourself a little bit in those little ways. Yeah. I, I think also realizing, or, Sam, you, you go. No, I was just gonna say great. That was a great call. Oh, thank you. 
I think, I think also realizing control is kind of at the crux of a lot of stress. You know what I mean? Is that we think we can control, like you think you can make your, you can keep your parents happy. You can keep your girlfriend happy. <clears throat> and to an extent you can influence those things. But in the end, we really have very little control of what works out. And, and actually I, I've been wrong a lot in how I try to control things. Like, you know, working with Chad, we'll disagree on like a creative thing and I'm wrong all the time. So I'm literally being reminded all the time that, if I was in control, it wouldn't actually be better. So just realizing that like you might be, you know, Superman in the shows is right all the time, but he probably in real life would like, you know, save the wrong person or he'd like throw a tank to save someone and it would like land on like a family. And then you'd be like, oh, maybe it'd be better if you just chilled a little bit. Uh, <laughs> a family. <laughs> yeah, he kills a family, dude. <laughs> a really good family. <laughs> Um, oh man oh dude here's a stressful one girlfriend's new landlord is super hot my dogs my girlfriend of a little over a year is moving into a new apartment in a few months she told me to look up the in the landlord on insta so i did the dude is a dime T why did she tell you to look him up to like revel in it with her the dude is a dime 10 out of 10 apparently he tells people he's had sex with miley cyrus and honestly it's believable <laughs> How can I how can I establish myself as an alpha if I ever run into him? Plot twist. He's renovating the first floor unit directly under my girlfriend and her squad for himself. So his passionate lovemaking soundscape will surely leak through the floor. What if he has Miley over? Truly yours, John. This is an all-time question. I think if he has Miley over, then he doesn't have to worry about his girl because the guy's with Miley. You know what Dude, I mean? So maybe great, great I would call. say I, I would say the best thing is to hope their sounds coming from the, the lower floor and then and then he's uh spoken for great call dude my my last girlfriend was gonna have a college basketball player move in with her i was freaking out dude i was like i was very transparent about it. i was like please do not do this i was like i just want to sleep at night do not this dude was like 6 10 i was like and jacked i was like do not have this dude move in and then fortunately it fell through um I don't know, dude. I don't know what to do. I guess JT, it's, it's, the, the, there's ahead. your na the naked thing that you do. Oh, dude, yeah. So when I was in high school, what I used to do is to, to, dis to, to thwart the alpha male. I used to throw a lot of parties, and I never hooked up with anyone. And what, what happened a lot of times is really cool guys who were, who were genuinely cool would come to my house, and they would hook up with all the girls I was in love with, and, and sometimes in my room. And then I would drive the girls home the next day. It was cool. But then... Um, what I would do sometimes to thwart the alpha males is, is um, I, would, I would get butt naked for the party. And then when the guys would come over, they were like, not to judge these guys, but they were homophobic. And so when they saw me naked, they were like, hey, dude, what the hell? And I was like, dude, it's all good. Come on in. And they were like, fuck that. I'm leaving. And I was like, that's right. Get the fuck out of here, dude. And so um, you can do that to the landlord. But I, it's dicey. I wouldn't do that. In, it, it's a different world we're living in today. And I, I wouldn't do what I did now. I think, but what I think Chad's saying is, is that this guy has, uh, everyone has a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Sam, you're really in has... deep waters with us here. I'm sorry, man. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah, everyone has a vulnerability. You know, this guy, there's something that you, I, I would say, don't worry too much about the alpha landlord that's because the there's something that's that the you bring to the table that's special you know and um so yeah there's something sweet about being the guy who hasn't slept with miley cyrus there's something very right. vulnerable and, and yeah and genuine in that and I, and i think your girlfriend will she knows that you know <laughs> she knows that you're 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 the guy i mean this guy you know maybe super hot but he's probably not the guy for her he could be just like a super hot guy to look at. You know, that's often what the, what's going on. <laughs> and and uh, iron sharpens iron. Like, you know, yeah. we, we, I think sometimes we just get frustrated that we have to deal with this shit. We're like, why the fuck does life keep making me like rise to the occasion? It's like, well, guess what? That's life. So rise to the occasion. Get more shredded. Read more books. Be more on your, on your own pros progress. And then you won't have to worry about this dude. I know that's kind yeah. of like a harsh way to think about it, but there, there's also something empowering about accepting the challenge. Totes. All right, last question. Bro with a broken heart. What up, Stokers? Me and my boys have a real close crew and we all live together at college. 
right before Q team, we got a tight, we got tight with a crew of girls, really sweet chicks, cute, great personality and sense of the humor. One of my boys started hooking up with a chick in this crew and they had a nice relation, but recently broke up. They both had the feelings that they wanted to see other people and not get too committed of a relationship while in college. Despite this reasoning, my dog is still super down in the dumps, FaceTiming me late at night in tears. He even refuses to go out to dinner safely outside with these girls because of the ex relationship. Now I'm finding it hard to be chill with these chicks out of respect to the feelings of my bro. What do you guys think? Is it putting my bro in an awkward position trying to kick back with these girls? And how can I help him bust out of this slump? Hank. Sam, what do you think? It's a tough one. I think, I think, um, this is kind of like episode eight of love life. It is a little bit. I don't know. I think, I think you gotta, you gotta hang in there for your buddy. And I don't know. I, I, I would prioritize that, but I don't know what you guys think. What do you guys think? I mean, I cry over, I cry over my feelings of love a lot. But I think what you got to tell your bro is, is that while the feelings you feel are real, the thoughts that accompany them aren't necessarily real. And that even though he's super busted up about this girl, the reality of it is, is that they're both probably better off without each other. And that the more he can embrace life beyond what happened in the past, the happier he'll be. Now, is he going to hear that? Maybe not, but you can just tell him that when he asks. And then and then you got to not worry about it, dude. You tell him how you feel and you be there for him. And then you got to live your own life. If you want to hang out with these girls, he'll come to realize that it's not a transgression. You just got to, you got to live your life. And, and then hopefully modeling that will inspire him. Yeah, I concur. I do too. Um, yeah. I think you gotta, you gotta help him. Uh, I don't know. You know, I think, I think the way to help him might be to get him over it. Yeah. Yeah. Can't, can't can't hide it is funny all the, it feels like a lot of these questions are like someone's really worried about something and all we can kind of tell them is like you gotta try to stop worrying about it yeah yeah and in due time yeah you'll look back on it and you'll be like oh what an interesting time of my life <laughs> you know it's, it's all good exactly it is all it's good. all good there and go. and uh yeah I'd take your buddy out for like a you know to like a diner and go go get an omelet you know just just be there for him what are we putting in that omelet there we go uh sam what are you putting in the omelet <laughs> i'm honestly not a huge omelet guy oh uh, interesting um, well, what, what would you opt for a, then a little more of a scramble guy probably nice. egg, 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 eggs benedict no i go simple i would do like a scramble with like spinach and cheese and like bacon or something like that so when you're like at your a buffet, style. when you're at a buffet and they got the omelet guy, you tell them just to hit it as a scramble. Uh, it depends. No, maybe in that case I would do the same thing as an omelet, but I don't like not like omelets. I just probably wouldn't opt for them. But yeah, right, maybe sometimes. To... But usually you tell the if you tell the omelet guy to do a scramble, he'll make an omelet and then he'll just fucking chop it up, and that's not really a scramble. So usually you just go for the omelet. Right. Well said. Um, yeah, and I think a lot of these dudes who write into our into our show or, or Danny two phones. If Danny two phones was writing into a podcast. Right. Help. There that's you go. That's a good, good, that's a good way of putting it. That, yeah. I think they need to just uh, chill. Who does Danny two phones end go up with? The flow. Do you know who he ends up with? It's a good question. We don't know yet. Could be, could be something we uh, revisit. Who knows? Is he circling back in season two? Not, and I, I, you know, there's no, there's no concrete plans for it, but it is, it is fun to know that any of those people could, could kind of, circle back yeah i love this high maintenance weave you guys are, are right having. yeah cool. thank you um, thank you i have one last question about the show i know some of these yeah. questions are very specific but i saw no it's with all good the, with the magnus character i think yeah. you made a super clutch call you didn't allow the character you initially wanted him to wear a fedora and then you decided <laughs> against him wearing a fedora because you thought right. it would it would tip too easily to the audience that he was a douche. And you really right. wanted the question of whether he was a douche to play out over multiple episodes. So, yeah. Yeah. When, yeah. No, it's just, that's, that's exactly what happened. We, uh, sorry, I didn't cut you off. No, I, I, I didn't really phrase it well as a question, but when did you realize that the fedora was just, it was too big of a douche tip? I think we laughed about it for a second and then it was sort of like, you know, it was sort of like, we got to hide the ball on this one and we got to kind of, you know, you got you. You really got to buy into their relationship, and if we make him kind of too broad of just like a hipster, you know, dingleberry, then 
people see it coming and and you kind of want them to buy into it and then and mm-hmm. then you know change it up i i saw a life coach and i i had a really bad webcam porn addiction and i was like hey <laughs> and i was like do you think i'll ever get over the shame of it and he's like you will for sure get past the shame of it but then i saw he had a fedora behind him on his desk right can't take like, his advice i was like i can't listen to this guy on shame I was yeah like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about yeah that's the wrong guy to ask all right <laughs> <laughs> sam enjoy uh the chicken tikka masala dude that's a good dish thank you man thank you guys i appreciate yeah. it thanks for talking to me yeah thanks for coming on the pod it was great chatting with you yeah likewise yeah. Awesome. stoked to see season two dude super thank pumped you. on it yeah is anna yeah, coming thank you. back um anna will be back yeah and um in uh you know she's obviously the main person we'll kind of weave through the second season cool oh nice very cool yeah, yeah. i think I, I think i saw her when i lived in i lived in west hollywood briefly and i think i saw her at my crunch which is like the gym could have been <laughs> that's a nice gym. i don't know i, I, I don't know a, really about her what her gym is <laughs> i wish i could tell you yeah that's the whole story. I just walked by. Oh, it's like, a good, it's Anna it's a good Ken- I think it's Anna. Yeah, it's, I think it's Anna Kendrick. <laughs> could have, could have uh, been. I'll, I'll ask it. her about crunch. I'll get back to you guys. Yeah, I yeah let her, let her know if she saw me. Too. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah let, her, let her ask her if she saw me just, you know, <laughs> on the treadmill. I guess. <laughs> yeah, tell her to set it up. Crank, I was cranking awesome. out some rinse. <laughs> I will do. Um, <laughs> right. Thank right. you, guys. Have yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah, be well, man. Have a good night. Later. Yeah, you How's too. Later. Nice, dude. Nice. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get a Topo Chico. Okay, I'm gonna go to the restroom. What's up, Stokers? You got just me here right now. It's Chad. I'm sipping on a nice Topo Chico. Mm. It tastes of. Uh, it's got a twist of lime hint in there, and. Um, yeah, it just makes me think of lime sometimes. You know, it's like, when did we establish limes as the party fruit? You know, it's, it could have very easily have been oranges, but it's like, no, limes. Limes are the ones that are going to go with tequila. Limes are the one that you think of when you, you know, want to, um, want to break out a Speedo in Barbados, you know. If you're gonna juggle something on the beach in a speedo, it's gonna be limes. And if you're gonna throw a freaking fruit in your drink when you're really trying to get turned up and to let the world know that you're ready to rock and you're ready to, you know, get on top of a table and start, you know, thrusting hard, you're gonna be drinking a drink with a lime. You know, vodka soda, tequila and soda, a tequila shot, a lime Ricky. You know, if you're more on the sober side, a key lime pie for dessert afterwards when you're talking to a nice lady that you had a really great connection with and, you know, you found yourselves just twerking to uh, an LMFAO song. And you're like, hey, you want to go get some key lime pie before we, before we uh, knock boots? Yeah. What's up, dude? What's up, dude? You just hit an ad? No, I, I did a little monologue on limes. Oh, hell yeah, dude. Because I'm having a Topo Chico with a twist of lime. Nice, dude. Mm-hmm. That's a great name for something, Topo Chico. It is. You want to get into it? You ready? Uh, yes. Yes, sir. Chad, who's your beef of the week? Uh, my beef of the week... My beef of the week is with like identity, you know. Damn, bro. And I'm not talking about like identity, like an existential thing. More of like your identity in terms of like within the government, and then within like banks and stuff. It's like, why does life have so much paperwork? You know what I mean? It's like, why do we have to be? Why? Why is there? Why do we have to have? Why is there so much documentation? Um, so we're trying to, to, why do we have so much documentation for like our existence? You know, it's like a social security card, a passport, a driver's license, you know, and then you, 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 all these banks and then uh, insurance and stuff. And it's like, 
you got to keep telling people that when you're moving and stuff, it's like, just let me, let me live, dude. Let me live. Let me be free. Yeah. You know what bugs me about it too is that it's, it's recurring. It's yeah. like, it's not like you establish it once and you're done. It's like, they're like 10 months later, they're like, Hey, you got to do it again. And you're like, I already did this. Yeah. Like, like registration for your car, that little sticker you got to put on your license plate. I have to do that every year. Yeah. Every year. Why? Why? Yeah. How about I got my license plate? I got my car. Shit's paid for. Let me cruise. Yeah. Why don't you register? Why don't you register it? You know, state. Completely. Dude, my beef of the week is with um. It's a it's another fight story. Sorry guys, I've been so aggro lately, but I just I feel like telling fight stories. It's a part of me. Um, this beef is with, and I might have already told this story, but it was with uh, Nico and Chewy. They were kids in my first grade class. They weren't in my class, but we had lunch at the same time, same grade, and we would play basketball every day. And they just bullied the shit out of me. I mean, they'd foul me. They talked trash to me. Um, Chewy would call me a maggot, hmm. which. I didn't know what it was and neither did my parents, <laughs> but I knew it was hateful Yeah, more because of what it rhymed with than what it actually was. But um, he would just call me that every day and he'd hit me and he'd bully me. And I, it was really messing with my head and, and with my day-to-day happiness. And I finally asked my parents, I'm like, Hey, like, what do I do? This kid won't stop bullying me. And my parents were like, you got to punch him. And I mm. was like, okay. So then I went to school the next day and I went to play basketball but I already had my mind made up that he was getting socked that day. So I drove to the basket. He fouled me, but so much lighter than he normally did. But I was just waiting for the slightest provocation. Right when he hits me, I just walk up to him already crying. I'm already mm-hmm. crying and I pop him in the face, but I'm like 70 pounds. So he doesn't drop or anything. He just hits, takes the punch, looks at me. He starts crying. He punches me back. I take yeah. the punch. I look at him and we go, all right, now let's go tell the yard duties who were like the adults that would supervise us during recess. As we're walking to the yard duties, which is about a 200 yard walk, I pretend that I have to tie my shoe. I get down on one knee to tie my shoe. I have Velcro shoes at the time, the strap kind. Mm -hmm. I fake put the strap on. I run up behind Nico. I think it was Nico. I run up behind Nico and with an open palm strike, I hit him in the back of the neck. He falls to the floor crying. I don't even think from the pain. I think from the level of betrayal I had committed. I don't think he realized humans could be that dark. Hmm. A bunch of girls come running over and they're like, oh my God, you monster. And I look at them with complete uh, angry dismissal. And I just go, you don't even know. And I just keep walking (laughs) to the yard duties. I can see you walking away too. I was like, you don't even know. And they're like, you're a monster. And I was like, yeah, maybe it looks that way. If only you knew the fucking truth. And then I got to the yard duties. I was like, hey, I popped Nico. He popped me. Then I cheap shot at him. We got to go to the principal's. He ended up, this is how unfair school systems are in all systems, really, like you were saying. Um, He got in more trouble than I did because he had a track record of kind of being a a troublemaker. But Mm -hmm. we ended up being really good buddies. And then a year later, some maniac was at an after school event with us. And me and him fought the kid together. And the kid, oh really? Yeah, and the kid kind of beat our ass. Oh but, wow! Uh, but we but we hung in there together as brothers. So uh, that's cool. We that probably together. felt better than if he had beat his ass. It did feel good to be going because this kid was a he wasn't even uh, physically stronger than us. He was just nuts, and he was like throwing angry kicks like with his shoe. Like I remember a parent was pulling him off of one of us, and he just kept kicking trying to get our face with his shoe. And I wouldn't mm. have done a move like that in second grade. Although I did cheap shot a kid in the neck. So I shouldn't take too high of a high road. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's my beef of the week. Um, Chad, who's your babe of the week? Uh, my babe of the week. Um, I only had my legend written down because I, I was like, I'm going to let my babe and beef come to me. Um, Cindy Prado. Dude, that's that's a great one. And she's always my baby of the week. I mean, you know, I, I have a GF and that I love, but you know, Cindy Prado is she's on Instagram. She's always wakes up dancing, you know, in a nice outfit. Um 
just super happy person, super hot, always working out, inspires you to want to, you know, just get out there and enjoy your life. And, and, and she's always she, like, she put up some fiery you know, stories one day where she got a message from some guy who was like, yeah, keep faking. Like you can afford that million dollar apartment that you, uh, shoot your videos and we know that like your your man pays for it or something and she went on this whole thing of like i work hard every day and i've worked to 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 build this following and get and you know and 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 become uh an influencer and a model and to to and i i I fought my way into the modeling industry because they always said i was too short to be a model but i got in through my own accord through social media and it was super inspiring. And I sent her a message. I was like, you go Cindy, like freaking tell that douche, you know, dude, that's fire. And yeah, she's just awesome. And, uh, yeah, I hope she, I hope she like hits us up one day and it's just like, um, if, if she were to tell me that I made her stoked, That'd be cool. That's nice, dude. Dude, my baby of the week is graham crackers. Mm. It's long overdue. I've been enjoying them since I was a kid. If I go into a pantry and that's one of the options, it's my top option. I think they're just, I don't know. They're kind of like saltines, but more fun to eat. And saltines yeah. are fun, but they got a little more sweet pop to them. But you don't feel like you're being too gross. It doesn't feel like you're eating like, you know, like pudding or something like that. It feels like you're still kind of like, on the high end of the healthy, unhealthy uh, spectrum. Right. And I don't know. I just had like seven of them today. I had like six yesterday. I didn't realize me and Joe had a bunch left in our upstairs cabinet, in our, in our, uh, in our tall cabinet. And dude, I've just been ripping through them and they're so delicious. And I mean, then, you know, you put them on s'mores or you, you taste them in milkshakes and they're always a good addition to anything. So Graham Crabbe, yeah. you're my baby of the week. Dude, um, I, I, fuck, I freaking love, they, they taste so good. They're so good. You can right? eat them all day. You can eat them all day. Dude, you get it. That's what's yeah. up, dog. Thank They're the you. best. You ever had the ones with that have like actual cinnamon on them? Yes. They're so dank. Those are really good. Yeah. Nice. Who's your legend of the week? My legend of the week is my hips. Uh, not just for the mobility and for the ability to help me walk and sit and, you know, and, and do this, you know uh move back and forth but just the fact that they 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 gyrate and they thrust they do and they're the they're the joints that allow you to thrust and to show the world that you're horny and to you know either back your dong away or present it forward hopefully in a respectful way that's not you know that's that's appreciated um so i just want to give a shout out to my hips you know thank you for staying well lubed thank you for for just gyrating non-stop and and allowing me to you know to do hump motions um in the air because that's what's up that is that's what's up, up. That's yeah what's up. well said dog thank um, you my legend of the week is Healy. He's a musician. And he has this song, Tucson, that I think right now is my number one song that when I'm feeling kind of like moody and emotional and like the protagonist and like a, in a romantic comedy going through kind of a second act dip because, you know, uh, my love is coming at the expense of my career. My career is coming at the expense of my love or, or some kind of uh, very relatable uh, human struggle. I, I like to walk around to his music and just be like, and just bop to it and be like, all right, man. Yeah, I'm in a music video right now and I'm, I'm just the character that's feeling so much. And, and this song is, is the voice of that feeling. So big ups to Healy. That's on Tucson. Bangs. It's deep. It's meaningful. It's, it, 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 you, you, it's a song you can dance to, but feel to as well. So uh, mm-hmm. a, lot of, a lot of love to him for that. Um, Hell yeah. Chad, what's your quote of the week? My quote of the week... Comes from the song uh, "I'm Real" with Ja Rule and J Lo. So good. Um, don't ask me where I've been or what I'm gonna do. 
Just know that I'm here with you. Don't try to understand. Baby, there's no mystery. Because you know how I am. I'm real. What you get is what you see. What you trying to do to me. You want to say you're mine. Be with me all the time. You're following someone love. And you just can't get enough. You're telling all your friends. She's a bad, bad bitch. Fuck yeah, dude. Bro, I didn't know you were going to get so deep in the flow there, dude. <laughs> oh, dude, thank you. God damn. Yeah, that dude. Nice. That nice. dude. Thank you. Dude, my quote of the week I picked up from Paul Feig in one of the post-Love Life episode uh, discussion uh, chunks. And uh, he says when he writes, he thinks about what George Bernard Shaw, the uh, great playwright who wrote Pygmalion, said. He said, all men mean well. And he writes his characters from that perspective, that all men mean well. And I think that is a good baseline to kind of understand the world from. Like every time you see someone making a mistake, be like, they're actually trying to make things better with that mistake. And it kind of, mm. I don't know, if you come at them from that place of good faith, you can kind of reach a resolution quicker, I think. Yeah. yeah. Hell yeah. What's your phrase of the week for getting after it? Uh, my phrase of the week for getting after it is... Um... Hey, is that an Italian chop? Nice, dude. Yeah. Dude, my phrase of the week for getting after it is from the film Remember the Titans. It comes from mm. a pivotal scene in the film where it's the first integrated football team racially in the state of Virginia. I think it's T.C. Williams. And the, uh, the, both sides have great cynicism towards one another. The white players and the black players can't get along. And then the best player from the white side, Bertier, goes up to the best guy uh, of the black dudes, Julius, and he talks to him about his lack of effort in practice. And he says, hey, man, you're giving no effort. He's like, that's the worst attitude I've ever seen. And then Julius tells him, hey, your white guys aren't playing hard for their black quarterback. So why am I going to play hard? I'm just going to get mine. And then he says, attitude reflects leadership, which really stings Bertier. So Coach Boone, played by Denzel Washington, is letting the players figure this out because he knows that they need to bond independent of him forcing it for the team to be strong. So then one of the white guys doesn't block for the black quarterback. And then Bertier gets in his face and he's like, when are you going to block for him, Ray? He's like, if you don't block for him this next play, I'll knock you out so long that you'll need a new haircut. That fires Julius up that, that Bertier is holding his, his white guys accountable. Julius lights up the quarterback on the next play. And then Bertier runs up to him. And this is my phrase that we forget after him. He goes, Ooh, Julius really stuck him on. Huh? Julius like, yeah, I love a little contact. And then Bertier goes strong side. And Julius is scared in this moment. He doesn't know if he can trust Bertier enough to go with him on this moment, but he looks into his eyes and he sees that he can. And then he goes, left side. Then Julius goes, left side. And they go, strong side, left side. So that's, that's awesome. We're going after it. Strong side, left side. That's the harmony great. that we need. That's a great flick. Good movie. Yeah. All right, dude. Well, I think that's it. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, of course. Great up, guys. Good to, oh, good to see you through Zoom. You. Yeah, socially distant hanging. Isn't that what we're all doing now? <laughs> yeah. I hope That's you're having sure. fun in Maine. Stay safe up there. Yeah, you guys too. So are you guys traveling for the holiday? Yeah. Uh, like... I, I, I'm going somewhere in January. Oh, cool. Uh, I guess we, we are traveling too. Yeah. All right. Well, that's awesome. Good stuff. Oh, yeah. 